Lynn Hiles Ministries presents Dr. Lynn Hiles, That You Might Have Life. And here's your host, Dr. Lynn Hiles. We want to welcome you to the program again today and thank you for joining us every week at the same time or via uh, YouTube, however you watch us. And uh, just quickly to tell you that we do have everything we have aired on the television program are archived on our YouTube channel. And the audio portions are also available on our podcast and on an RSS feed for your Android devices because we are about number 40 or something in that range in dealing with our roadmap to reformation. The easiest way you can do this to go back and get this information is to go to my website at lenhouse.com and in the upper right hand corner there is an icon for the YouTube channel and for the uh, podcast and the RSS feed. While you're there, just subscribe and every time we upload a new program, you will receive an email letting you know that it's there. It costs you nothing. It's free of charge. We are putting it up there as a service to you, but take advantage of them because we may pull some of this stuff down after a while and use them in Bible college courses because we are getting requests to use this material and much of what we have filmed over the years in a Bible college type setting. So you want to take advantage of it while you still can. We've been talking about Ezra and Nehemiah, the roadmap to Reformation, and how they are a pattern of a greater fulfillment. I showed you over and over again over the last 40 weeks or better how that uh, these guys were prophesying to build and restore the tabernacle of God and the city of God. In the New Testament, the tabernacle of God is not a place, it's a people. We are built out of lively stones as a habitation of God through the Spirit. We're going to talk about tabernacles more today, again, because we're dealing with the Feast of Tabernacles. We're also talking about the restoration of the city of God, and we know that in the New Testament, the city of God is not a place in the Middle East. It is a people. It is the bride, the Lamb's wife, according to Revelation chapter 21, according to Revelation chapter 3. He said to him that overcomes, I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem. And Jesus Himself said, You are a city set on a hill that cannot be hid. What we've done is showed you in this roadmap to Reformation how each one of the restoration of these 12 gates correspond to something that God is trying to bring restoration to. Just like the city of God in Revelation 21 has 12 gates, the city in Nehemiah has 12 gates. Zechariah and Ezra, but especially Zechariah, while he was prophesying to encourage the work of the building of this natural physical building about 400 and 500 years prior to the time of Jesus, Daniel prophesied that 483 years from the time of the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem until the Messiah, the Prince, would be 483 years. He prophesied that in chapter 9 of the book of Daniel, and in Ezra chapter 7, under King Artaxerxes, the command goes forth to restore and build Jerusalem, and exactly 483 years, Jesus gets up and declares, He has sent me to declare the year of the favor of God. And so he begins to show you that this Reformation is bigger than what's happening under Ezra and Nehemiah. It's really a prophetic picture of the fulfillment and reformation under Messiah the King, the Messianic age that would come. And so even when Zechariah prophesied, he said that the cornerstone would be laid with shouts of grace, grace to it. See, Jesus came, His first public message was He preached favor. But also you see in John chapter 1, He says to them, Moses gave you the law, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ and of His fullness have all we received in grace for grace. That's the only other time I know of in the Scripture that there's a double enunciation of grace. When it's talking about grace for grace, the cornerstone was laid, and it says, We beheld His glory as of the only begotten of the Father, and He, the Word became flesh, and here's the key word, it tabernacled among us. The word tabernacled among us is the Greek equivalent to the word that we translate for the Feast of Booths, or the Feast of Tabernacles. Now in Ezra, let me see, in Ezra chapter, uh, let, me, let me pull my notes so you can get your reference for you. Well, it, let me say in, in Nehemiah chapter 8, of course, 
And then again, you find it in Ezra chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, and in Zechariah chapter 14, they allude to the Feast of Tabernacles, and the Feast of Tabernacles was celebrated in Nehemiah 8 at the Ephraim gate and at the water gate. And so we showed you how that, that speaks of the restoration of double portion and the restoration, but the Ephraim gate was where they celebrated, and the water gate was where they celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles. Now what I want to do today is I want to show you where Jesus fulfills this feast in the New Testament. In John chapter 7, it starts like this. Says, After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for He would not walk in Jewry, because the Jews sought to kill Him. Now the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles was at hand. So Jesus is coming to the Feast of Tabernacles. Remember now, this is preluded by a fulfillment of a Zechariah prophecy that your king comes to you riding on a colt, the foal of an ass, and they spread their garments before him and cried, Hosanna in the highest. You know, I would think that these religious dudes who knew the Word of God and knew the Scriptures should have seen that everything they were looking for was standing right in front of them, and they were about to miss the day of their visitation because they did not recognize Messiah because He didn't come the way they thought He would come. He didn't come like David to lead a revolt against the Romans on a war horse. He came meek and lowly riding upon a colt, the foal of an ass. And He comes in here into the city, now the feast of Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand, and his brethren therefore said unto him, Depart hence, and go into Judea, that thy disciples also may see the works that thou doest. For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou do these things, show thyself to the world, for neither did his brethren believe in him. Then Jesus said unto them, My time is not yet come, but your time is all, always ready. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me, because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. Go you up unto this feast. I go not up yet to this feast, for my time is not yet come, full come. And when he had said these words unto them, he abode still in Galilee. But when his brethren were gone up, then when he also up unto the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret, then the Jews sought him at the feast and said, Where is he? And there was much murmuring among the people concerning him. For some said he's a good man, others said no, but he deceived the people. Howbeit no man spake openly of him for fear of the Jews. Now about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught, just like Ezra and Nehemiah did in the beginning. He begins to teach the people. And the Jews marveled, saying, How knoweth this man letters, never having learned? And Jesus answered them, said, My doctrine is not mine, but this, but his that sent me. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God, or whether I speak of myself. He that speaketh of himself seeks his own glory, but he that seeks his glory that sent him, the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. Did not Moses give you the law, and yet none of you keepeth the law? Why go you about to kill me? Now that, that right there will preach. You preach the law, he said, but none of you keeps the law. Why go you about to kill me? The people answered and said, Thou hast a devil which goes, who, thou hast a devil who goes about to kill you? Jesus answered and said unto them, I have done one work, and you all marveled. Moses therefore gave unto you circumcision, not because it is of Moses, but because it was of the fathers. And ye on the Sabbath day circumcise a man. If a man on the Sabbath day receives circumcision, that the law of Moses should not be broken, are you angry because I have made a man ever whole on the Sabbath day? Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Then said some of, the, some of them of Jerusalem, Is not this he whom you seek? to kill. Uh, but lo, he speaketh boldly, and they say nothing unto him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is the very Christ? Howbeit we know this man whence he is, but when Christ cometh, no man knoweth whence he is. Then cried Jesus in the temple as he taught, saying, You both know me, and you know whence I am. And I am not come of myself, but he that sent me is true, whom you know not. But I know him, for I am from him, and he has sent me. Then they sought to take him, but no man laid hands on him, because his hour was yet not come. And many of the people believed on him and said, When Christ comes, he will do more miracles than these which this man has done. The Pharisees heard the people murmured such things concerning him, and the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him. Then said Jesus unto them, Yet a little while, and I am with you 
and then I go unto him that sent me. You shall seek me and shall not find me, and where I am you cannot come. Then said the Jews among themselves, Whither will he go, and that we shall not find him? Will he go up unto the, and be dispersed among the Gentiles, and teach the Gentiles? What matter I'm saying is this, he said, You shall seek me and shall not find me, that where I am you cannot come. In the last day, but this is what I want you to see, in the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man's thirsty, let him come unto me and drink. And he that believeth on me, as the Scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Many of the people, therefore, when they heard of this saying, said of a truth, this is the prophet. Now I want you to see this because Jesus is fulfilling something as part of the ceremony that was used at the Feast of Tabernacles. Now remember, He's showing up at the Feast of Tabernacles and He's making a man every whit whole on the Sabbath day. What we need to celebrate is the fact that Jesus has brought us into a perpetual Sabbath, His finished work, to make us every whit whole. And the only thing that holds you back is religious people who can't see the fulfillment of what He's doing here. But you would think they knew the Psalms, they knew the prophets, they knew Zechariah, they knew even these rituals that they were actually doing right now at the Feast of Tabernacles, of the Feast of pouring out of the water. There's a ceremony of pouring out of the water that takes place at the Feast of Tabernacles Hence, that's why they're at the water gate and the Ephraim gate to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles because it's at the water gate that they would get some of the water. Now watch this because I'm going to read you some history about this. The celebration of the water pouring, the Feast of Tabernacles, the water pouring became a focus of the joy that was commanded for the Feast of Tabernacles. For or no other festival or the people commanded to be joyful. Not, not, uh, none of them are they commanded to be joyful. On Passover, it was called the season of our freedom. At Pentecost, it's the season of the giving of the Torah. But the Mishnah says that, there, that, says that the ritual was very elaborate for rejoicing, even righteous celebration, a rejoicing at the house of the water drawing. The ceremony took place every day except for the first best day of the feast, describes a ceremony in detail, including a portrait of venerable sages juggling lighted torches and performing somersaults as part of the celebration. In other words, these people were doing somersaults. You talk about celebration, man. It was a party in the streets to parallel none other. I'm going to tell you something. If you get a real understanding of what Jesus did to make you every whit whole and the water He's poured out, I'm going to tell you something. You're going to find it'll jerk a praise up out of you. It'll make you come to a place of joy and celebration like you've never come to. The Talmud, the Talmud which was a Hebrew writing, says states he was not uh, th- that there was not seen rejoicing. Uh, well, let me let me go back and read this. I'm not reading it correctly. It says the Talmud states. He was not seen rejoicing at the place of the water drawing, has never seen rejoicing in, in, in his life. If you've never seen, in other words, if you've never seen this kind of rejoicing, you've never seen the level of this kind of rejoicing in your life, if you've never seen the waving of these things that they were doing and the somersaults and the dancing and the music and the food and the feasting and the celebration that was going on. So the water pouring ceremony became then the occasion for an outpouring of intense joy. The daily tabernacle ceremony, the priests were divided into three divisions. This is how they would celebrate this. They would slay the sacrifices. That this time, uh, the, the first group, there was three divided into three divisions. The first group would slay the sacrifices. The second group of priests went out by the eastern gate of the temple and went to the Mashvat Valley, for the ashes were dumped at the beginning of the Sabbath. So they carried the ashes out, because He's going to give you beauty for ashes. Then they would cut the willows, they would cut willow branches. Willows had to be 25 foot in length after this. They would form a line with all the priests holding the willows, about 25 or 30 feet behind this first rogue priest. They would remain about 25 or 30 feet behind him allowing room for the willows 
to, uh, and the whole row to switch back and forth, and they, the whole row back to the, they would follow this road priest all the way back to the temple that was lined on both sides of the road, was lined with pilgrims as they went to Jerusalem to fe- celebrate festivals as they were commanded by God in Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 16. The willows would make a swishing sound, a swishing noise. Meanwhile, a third group of priests headed by the high priest went out the gate known as the water gate. Now you see, this feast was being celebrated at the water gate and at the Ephraim gate. The priest would go out known as the water gate, and they had gone to the pool known as Siloam. Jesus goes to a pool of Siloam and heals a man who was blind from his mother's birth because it really is the picture of natural Israel who has become blind and needs to be sent to a pool of Siloam where they could wash and their eyes be opened to the revelation of what Jesus has done to restore and heal even on the Sabbath day from their sin. They would go and draw from the pool of Siloam. Let me read this again. The the, the high priest went out of the gate known as the water gate. They had gone to the pool known as Siloam, which means gently flowing waters. That's where the priest had a golden vase and drew the water, knowing that water was known as the living water, it was held in a vase and in a system held, it also was held in a silver vase containing wine. They had a silver vase containing wine and they had a vase containing water, water and wine together, symbols of the Holy Spirit. Remember, Jesus at the Feast of Tabernacles is about to do the fulfillment of this water festival event. And they, he, the, the, they had water that they drew from the gently flowing waters of the pool of Siloam, they had a silver vase containing wine. And just as the priest in the valley began to march toward Jerusalem, so did the priest begin to swish the noises of the willows behind that rogue priest. And they began to swish the willows and to make a noise of the willows was a symbol of the moving of the Holy Spirit. As each party reached their prospective gates, trumpets was blown. Then one man would stand up to play the flute. The flute represented the Messiah because the flute player is called the pierced one. I think that's incredible. But the guy who played the flute was called the pierced one. Now here's Jesus in the temple who's about to be the pierced one, and he's about to sound a trumpet. And he came, he, and, and it, it, it means uh, the pierced one. And it goes on to say that the flute player was called the, the was called the pierced one, of the flute player. Led he led the procession. The pierced one blows the call for the wind and the water to enter the temple. The pierced one calls for the wind and the water and the swishing and all of the ceremonial stuff to enter the temple. The priests, the swishing, the willows come into the temple. It is at this point that the people start singing the song from Isaiah chapter 12, verse number 3, with joy do we draw water from the wells of salvation. Now, I'm going to tell you they sang that song every time that they uh, celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles. They sang from the book of Isaiah with joy we draw water from the wells of salvation. It is in this very setting that Jesus walks through probably the water gate as the high priest with the swishing of the branches going on and the moving of the wind and the sounding of the flute player of the pierced one. And all of this atmosphere is all around them that should have been historic pictures revealing something. And just at the moment when the high priest would get ready to pour out this drink offering and offer it up. And just as he was about to pour that drink offering out, Jesus shows up at the feast. It didn't seem like he was there at the point. He didn't show up until a little later in the feast. But Jesus shows up at that moment. And as the true high priest, he stands up just exactly at the moment when the priest is about to take that 
vessel and pour the water out. Jesus stands up and says, if any man's thirsty, let him come to me and I'll drink of, he'll drink of the water of life and it'll be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. For this spoke he concerning the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit was not yet given. Jesus was inaugurating the Feast of Tabernacles and the fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles that would be so powerfully pictured in the fact that in this Feast of Tabernacles, it would be a mighty, mighty, mighty move of the Spirit. Hallelujah. The swishing of those branches was the moving of the wind. And the moving of the wind was a speak of the moving of the Spirit. The outpouring of the wine was an outpouring of the wine of the Holy Ghost. And the pouring of the drink offering is the outpouring of the water of life freely. See, if you can't see the fulfillment of Jesus coming in to, to, to inaugurate a better temple, a better city, a better sacrifice, and we see all of that fulfilled, of course, when we get into the book of Revelation, where Jesus begins to declare, if any man is thirsty, let him come to me and drink of the water of life without cost, for this spake he of the Spirit. But as he comes into uh, Revelation, the 21st chapter, he's talking about, let him come to me, and I'll give him to drink of the water of life without cost. And it's in that same outpouring of the water that God begins to wipe all tears off of all faces because they are moving from the Day of Atonement, the day when it was time for mourning, for solemnness, for afflicting the soul, to a time of great celebration. I believe we're living in a time of great celebration. I don't know about you, but I'm celebrating the fact that I don't have to wait on this any longer, that the Holy Spirit has been given, and out of our belly can flow rivers of living water. I believe there's a call of God to the nations right now to come to the Feast of Tabernacles. Because Zechariah says, if you don't come to this feast, there's not going to be any rain on that nation. But I believe God is about to move, and I believe He has been moving. Let me just tell you this. First of all, I believe it began and was inaugurated in this first century, but every generation has the opportunity to either fall into demise or to continue to bring about the Reformation. There is a reviving of the stones out of the heaps of rubbish, and there is a sound that's coming, I believe, of the swishing of the palm branches as we begin to come together as the tabernacle of God, as the chalupa, as the sukkoth, as the booth, as the tabernacle in which God lives. Look, look, Revelation 21, the message Bible says, God has moved into the neighborhood. He's made His home in men. And then you go on down through Revelation 21, and I saw no tabernacle, no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple thereof. Because Jesus is the temple in which this temple of God we are a part of. See, we're part of His body, part of this building, part of this structure, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ Himself being chief cornerstone. I want to call forth a word of action today. If you're a man of God, a woman of God, a preacher, a saint of God, listen, it's time to arise and build. Stop preaching that God is about finished with this planet and get involved in His ongoing recovery program called new creation. God wants to redeem and restore. He's not abandoning His creation and evacuating His saints. He's raising up sons and daughters. He's giving us Ezra and Nehemiah, the Holy Spirit, and the Helper to begin to bring us forth to this water gate. We're out of this water gate, and out of your belly is going to flow rivers of living water, where the Word of God is going to be preached and declared that the Day of Atonement was the work of Calvary and the finished work of Jesus Christ 
who has made atonement for us. And because of that atonement, He's going to wipe all tears off of all faces and our weeping days are over and God is in the business of restoration and reformation. I don't know about you, but I want to get my branch of a willow tree and make some swishing noise and begin to see the wind begin to move and the Spirit of God begin to move. I prophesy in this season and in this segment and say, you're going to hear the sound of a mighty rushing wind once again begin to blow because the wind of God is blowing in the earth. There is a sound. There's a sound of the swooshing of the branches. I believe God is calling us to come together. I, you, you heard me share way back when I talked about viruses and victories, how that every time there was a pandemic, it was always followed by a massive move of the Spirit that resembled something to do with Reformation and especially Azusa Street. At the turn of the century, when God poured out His Spirit right in the middle of a pandemic, a black man, a white man, and a woman got together, which is totally against the culture of that day. And they began to gather because it was the branches of trees that didn't normally grow together. And they began to come together in unity. And God said, I can put my approval on this because this looks like heaven. And I'm going to make a swishing sound. And the wind of heaven began to blow on that and it released what we've known for the last 100 years as Pentecost being restored back to the church. But I'm telling you, we are standing in a day when God is doing something bigger than Pentecost. He's restoring us to the Feast of Tabernacles and the Feast of the Outpouring of Water and the Feast of the Outpouring of Wine and the Feast at this Water Gate and this Ephraim Gate where we've received double for our trouble and your King has come to you and the Tabernacle of God is with men. If we just realize the potential of what it means of what we've got inside of us and become restorers of the breach, healers of the stroke of the wound, and begin to, instead of bringing division, start to bring unity, this is a feast of unity. It's a feast of celebration. It's a time of ingathering. The only thing that can bring about this harvest is going to be God calling His people back together again as the unity of the faith is enjoined as we endeavor to keep the bond of peace and the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. It's time to stop dividing and start gathering. It's not going to come from the White House. It's going to come from the house of God. This unifying is not going to come from political events. It's going to come by the power of the Holy Ghost. You've been gracious. Thank you for joining us. We'll start on another gate perhaps next week. But if you'd like to help support what we're doing to take the gospel around the world, please go to our website. It's the easiest way to give an offering via credit card or debit card. You could also become a monthly partner there by just telling that to make a monthly debit. You can also call the number on the screen. And if no one is there to take your call, please leave a message and we will return your call or you can give by check or money order to the address that will come up on the screen. But we ask you to do it today. We do need your help to take the gospel around the world. God bless you. Thank you for joining us. I am excited to announce the release of my latest book titled The Great I Am. In this book, we will explore the seven times in the Gospel of John that Jesus says, I am. When he uses that phrase, it is always in contrast to something from the Old Covenant. For instance, they thought Moses and the law was the door into the sheepfold, but Jesus said to them, I am the door. They thought that Israel was the true vine, but Jesus said to them, I am the vine, you are the branches. As you read the pages of this book, you will discover that Jesus removed the covenant of death and replaced it with the covenant of life. Get your copy of the book, The Great I Am, today.